Hi, so it's been a while. Um, nice to see you all again. We're kind of going to roll into something here, and uh, I'm just going to do a little disclaimer about this board game review. Um, if you're watching this and uh, you're looking for some sort of confirmation bias in regards to the Israeli-Hamas conflict, you're not going to find it here. Uh, I'm not here to um, provide more confirmation bias and already a uh, really hot topic. I also want to go ahead and say that I'm really lucky that the content creation I do, I don't have to um, depend on being liked or depend on being popular. Um, this is just something I do as an artist and as a hobby. So if I say something that's greatly offensive and a lot of people unsubscribe or I say something that seems outrageous and a lot of people end up liking and subscribing it, it doesn't hit my bottom dollar. The idea of like being in the algorithm or monetization, I have no real goal for. So to that degree, compared to a lot of other people who do any content at all on YouTube, I've got just a blank check as far as uh, my First Amendment rights and what I want to say. So, with that out of the way, as I do this review, I'll be pulling from primary and secondary resources. And some of those that you hear uh, might come off as offensive to you or obscene, but I'm simply quoting, you know, what a British officer might have experienced in the Palestine Mandate um, in regards to the IDF and how that reflects the rules that were put in the Genesis game uh, and the Jerusalem game. And that's just simply, you know, Facts are facts. I'm not there to actually sit there and say, and this makes this side bad historically, and this side's bad now, or this makes the Palestinian side bad now. You know, at the end of the day, current events have inspired me to go ahead and do this board game review, and that might seem a little morally questionable, but that's really no different than uh, Francis Ford Coppola, who originally um, decided that uh, he was wanted to sh actually shoot a film about Vietnam during the Vietnam War, with actual U.S. soldiers during a documentary. So he, at the time, before he went forward with that, he seemed okay with watching, you know, soldiers die and making some sort of film out of it. This also puts me in no different than Pierre Schaefer, who uh, did the 317th Platoon and then later went on to do the Anderson Platoon, which was a documentary really shot in Vietnam where people were killed and people died. As mentioned in previous squad leader review videos, when we think about or we mention the Cold War, things quickly fall into a shade of gray. And there's nothing grayer than the Arab-Israeli wars. Generally, if you study the Cold War, um, if you listen to podcasts, watch documentaries, things of that nature, it's almost as if these wars are separate to themselves. Perhaps that's because unlike the Vietnam War, French Indochina, um, like even the uh, Cuban Revolutionary Wars, there's still a high emotional investment in how you feel about the conflicts when you look at them historically, as opposed to these other things where there's casual conversation. Within all of that, uh, it becomes a very taboo subject. And despite that, according to Critical Hit, with their last re-release of the Arab-Israeli Wars, it is their highest selling module of all time. So what that means is there is a genuine, uh, general interest in this subject, but it's a little too taboo still for us to bring about in online forms, uh, through review and content such as this. Unlike the Battle of Hue, the Battle of Den Bien Phu, the Battle of Aya Drang, uh, other Cold War critical hit advanced squad leader games that I've taken reviews of, Genesis is, is unique that it doesn't represent one battle. It represents nine months of conflict where both the Arab armies and the Israeli armies uh, quickly evolved into different fighting forces. So within the actual rule sets, you have to actually represent the political conflicts within the Israeli army itself and the Arab armies that were reeling from decolonization uh, of Britain, uh, forming their own armies, and actually going on offensive operations the whole time. So how do you balance all that out and how do you make it work? Uh, speaking of decolonization, uh, that's actually going to be my uh, biggest criticism as we go in to look at the rules, is where are the most important figures in the foundation of Israel and the Israeli-Arab Israel, Israeli wars? Where are these guys. The limitations of this video do not allow me to go into the entire history of British influence in Israel or the state of Palestine, but what I will do is I will go ahead and put a uh, link in my about video to the casual historian who does a very, very good, um, pretty much unbiased um, history of exactly how um, British colonialism got us to our present 
date in 1948, being the Israeli Arab Wars, which is what um, this board game review covers. But I do kind of want to mention some things that uh, are important contextually as to why I think the British should have been included uh, in this squad leader comp. So starting in 1921, uh, the Turkish Empire is over. Uh, the League of Nations in is informed. For those who don't know, it's kind of like the unsuccessful um, precursor or step parents of the uh, United Nations. Part of that is part of their negotiations after World War One is uh, what became Palestine Israel was uh, given to Britain as a mandate to actually control to um, take care of the people. But it, what it turned out to be was a, another excuse for colonial expansion, which made perfect sense, and that's how Britain would have lobbied it, because they already had heavy influence in Saudi Arabia, they already had heavy, heavy influence in Syria and Jordan and every other oil-producing country. So they have resources that they can exploit, uh, they have a country that needs to be maintain, maintained, um, so they have no real desire to give anyone in that country any legitimate freedom. Let's fast forward to World War II. Well, at that point, industry had developed even more, particularly in Haifa in Israel, and Britain needed that oil to supply the armies fighting in World War II. So, once again, uh, very resource important, very important to keep things in order and keep Britain in control. <clears throat> now, after we get to the end of World War II, the British Empire is over, they are broke, they've lost lots of territories already from the Lend-Lease Act, it's getting to the point where they have no choice to pack it in, but British prestige is still on the line. As is the fear of what could happen to Britain, who is currently in a huge economic decline um, in regard to losing those oil resources. You have to remember that Britain stayed on uh, food rations, I believe, all the way till the 1950s because they were hit so hard from that war. So with all that combined, there was a high vested interest for Britain to stick it out to get Palestine under control to get the Arabs and Israelis to get along with each other and to continue to rule the country as a colony. Uh, because of that, pretty soon, guerrilla wars were going to break out and Britain went into a three-year war. Israel, the people that would go to fund, found Israel proclaimed that, you know, the British are going to leave. So without that conflict between the British army and what would later become the IDF, um, there is no foundation of Israel. It is central um, to have that, so I don't understand why it wouldn't be put in the game. British Major General Dare Wilson, who served with the 6th Airborne Division while in Palestine, is the author of the book with the 6th Airborne Division of Palestine, 1945 to 1948. And if you happen to not believe that Britain did not put a significant military forces in the Palestine Mandate, he provides a wonderful appendix of the Order of Battle of 1946 of the British Army. The Headquarters, 6th Airborne Division, 2nd Parachute Brigade, 4th Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, 5th Battalion, 6th Battalion, all Parachute Regiments, the 3rd Parachute Brigade, 3rd Battalion, 8th Battalion, 9th Battalion, all Parachute Regiments, 6th Air Landing Brigade, 2nd Battalion of the Orksfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, 1st Battalion of the Royal Ulster's Rifle, 1st Battalion of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, Royal Armored Corps, 6th Airborne Armored Reconnaissance Regiment, Royal Artillery, the 53rd Air Landing Light Regiment, the 2nd Air Landing Anti-Tank Regiment, the 2nd Forward Observer Unit, Royal Engineers, the 1st Airborne Squadron, the 9th Airborne Squadron, the 286th Airborne Park Section, Royal Corps of Signals, the 6th Airborne Division of Signals, the 21st Independent Parachute Company, Royal Army Service Corps, 63rd Composite Company, 398th Composite Company, 716th Company, Royal Army Medical Corps, 127th Parachute Field Ambulance, 224th Parachute Field Ambulance, 195th Air Landing Field Ambulance, 74th Field Hygiene Section, Royal Army Ordnance Corps, 6th Airborne Division Ordnance Field Park, Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, 6th Airborne Division Workshops, Air Landing Light and Aid Detachment, 6th Airborne Division Battle School, 6th Airborne Division Training School, 6th Airborne Division... What does Dare Wilson write about when he's reflecting about his time in the Palestinian Mandate? Well, in his memoirs, he wrote that, Here are two communities with practically no characteristic in common, and either of whom were liable to cause trouble. Each had to be studied in detail, and each would respond to different treatment differently. 
Not only was it necessary to consider the correct counteraction to a move by an Arab or a Jew against the mandatory power, but there were also on August 24th, the officer administering the government of Palestine, J.V.W. Shaw, wrote to the new colonial secretary, Arthur Creech Jones, the, of the Labour Party, having come to power in Brit Britain in July, of the warnings of the new Israeli nationalist insurgents. The young Jewish extremists, the products of a vicious educational system, know neither toleration nor compromise. They regard themselves as morally justified in violence, directed against any individual or institution that impedes the complete fulfillment of their demands. These zealots of today, from Poland, Russia, and the Balkans, have yet to learn toleration and recognition of the rights of others. As the Foreign Secretary said of the Balkans, these people do not understand what we understand by the meaning of the word democracy. The Jewish agency may deplore terrorism, but every immoderate speech, such as those quoted at the beginning of this letter, the flagrant disregard on one hand of the authority of the government and maintaining law and order on the other for the Arab cause, the chauvinism and intolerance of their educational system will all contribute to an atmosphere in which the fanatic and the terrorist flourish. So this is pulling directly from the Advanced Squad Leader Rulebook for Multi-Man Publishing, second edition. Green and airborne troops represented by a 648. They have the Gurkhas, which I won't make much of a mention of, as they really only fought the Japanese and are not relevant to the conflict we're covering here. But probably the most interesting rule that the British have is cowering. British troops were renowned for their marksmanship and calmness under fire or moral fiber, as they termed it. Therefore, their elite and first-line units are immune to cowering effects. If anyone in the comments can tell me a, a primary or secondary resource that um, spoke about British training and markmans markmanship, I did some research, I couldn't find anything, so I'm kind of interested as to where the writers for the rule book um, found this from. But not everyone knows what cowering is, so that would be a good example to show how that works. Alrighty, let's say in this scenario it's December 1947. The Israeli forces are trying to move south here to go on reprisal raids against Arab forces who have attacked their villages. And between them is this small British army that's trying to keep them from crossing over. Now, the movement phase is over for the Israeli forces and we are now in defensive fire phase. So this 458, which is a uh, stack of 12 with no service weapons, is going to fire at the 558s at C12, who are in what I can as best tell is possibly a wood building, maybe a stone one. And based on that, uh, we're going to go ahead and do the roll and do an example of how cowering works. Okay, these are our dice results. So on the 12 firepower column, we rolled a six, which is doubles, which would normally enable cowering, plus two for the dice roll modification of the Israelis being in the wooden building. So normally all other units uh, that don't have this rule, we would actually, because they did roll doubles, it's considered cowering. Instead of rolling the one morale check uh, as a dice roll, roll result, it would go down to the previous column, which using the modern infantry file, fire table for advanced squad leader, the 12 goes down to an eight, and it would be a normal morale check. But since British troops do not cower, it stays the same, and it would be a one morale check for the Israeli forces. So. The no cowering rule is pretty simple in the world of advanced squad leader. It is often easy though to kind of forget that it exists when you're really kind of going through a very long game or you're just trying to finish playing as soon as possible. Hmm, my table has suddenly gotten a lot firmer. So, considering the British aren't in the rules at all, what would be the best way to address this? I would suggest some sort of expansion pack that would actually include British rules for the 
Israeli-Palestinian wars and Ads and Counters in as well. So this is actually the first time post-World War II that Britain has to fight a counterinsurgency war where they're trying to keep the British colony, being known as the Palestine, Palestinian Mandate, and they are fighting both Israeli and Arab forces who are basically trying to control the towns and essentially uh, ruin British authority and replace it with their own. With that in mind, Britain, pretty much like the American forces in Iraq, uh, once Petraeus came in around 2008-2009, are essentially operating as a police force. So what kind of rules and squad leader would kind of show the limitations of force that naturally come during counterinsurgency operations? Probably the best way to do this would be pretty simple, is once you add the British in, uh, you keep the no cowering rule that's kind of based on their World War II and squad leader tradition, and then I would add that Britain may never massacre, and Britain must always take prisoners. So whoever plays the British, even if they have higher firepower than the Israeli or Arab forces, are always going to be stuck with this kind of cumbersome nature that is always taking prisoners. As you know, if you take too many, it ruins your movement points, it makes it harder to get your actual goals done. That's how I would do that. Since so we've kind of covered the British, who actually aren't in the rules at all, it's time to start looking at the combatants that are included in the Israeli and Arab wars, and we'll go ahead and start with the Israeli forces. The Israeli army that operated before the foundation of the Jewish state was an extremely complex one. Frankly, it's a miracle they've accomplished what they did in 1948. So basically, you had three different military groups operating. The Haganah, which would be the most similar to the British military and military forces of World War II, the Ingram that operated with uh, terrorist tactics and gang-like tactics, and most famously, the Stern Gang, whose specialty was terrorizing the British government. Altogether, they didn't always agree in principle on how war should be won, how the country would be formed, what areas would be taken over, what areas would stay Arabic. But nevertheless, they did manage to form one country. And now we need to take a look, look at how History kind of depicts the unique arguments these groups had with each other, and also how that it applies to the rules in this game. Israel, by historian Martin Gilbert, has an excellent section in the book describing the differences between the three Jewish forces that later formed a country. I'm quoting from page 134. Within three weeks, the violence reached a climax. On July 22nd, the Ingrin blew up a wing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. 91 people were killed, including British administrators working in the hotel. Many of these administrators were Arabs and Jews. There was a shock of horror among Jews and Arabs alike in Palestine, and among critics of Jewish terrorism throughout the dysphoria and in the non-Jewish world. The British did include a postmaster general of Palestine, G.D. Kennedy, a veteran of the retreat from Mons in 1914. One of the Arabs killed, Jules Gries, was a senior assistant accountant with the Secretariat and a Catholic, and had been an officer in the Turkish army in the First World War, when he was taken prisoner by the British. Among the Jews killed were Julius Jacobs, a senior mandate official and secretary of the Jerusalem Music Society, who had served in the 2nd Jewish Battalion under Albany, Dr. William Goldschmidt, a refugee from Hitler's Germany in 1933 who had risen to be an assistant legal draftsman to the government of Palestine, and Claire Rousseau, a 19-year-old telephone operator in the Secretariat. One of the several drivers killed was an Armenian. Twenty British soldiers were also killed. The Jewish agency denounced what it called the dastardly crime perpetuated by the gang of desperados and called on the Jews of Palestine to rise up against these outrages. The chief rabbi, Ben Zion Uzili, spoke of his loathing and abhorrence at the crime. The Jewish Community Council warned that the abyss opening before our feet by irresponsible men who had carried out a lonesome act, watching the Jewish mourners at one of the many funeral processions, the Palestine Post commented, the faces were set by expressionless, as though they were burying not only their own countrymen, but a cherished hope. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon on July 23rd, all work and traffic stopped in the Jew Jewish Jerusalem at 3 o'clock in, in morning for the dead. As a result of the King David bomb, the recent agreement between the Haganah and Ingram broke down. The Jewish resistance movement was at an end, 
and the Engren and Stern gang began to operate once more. So this is a snippet of the actual rules from the newest version of Genesis. And we look here, Bob O'Connor, who originally designed the game and I believe wrote the rules, uh, Rule 1.5, Ingram, Lee, Haganah Animosity. Unless in Jerusalem, Ingram, Lee, and Haganah Infantry may never stack, nor at any time may good order Ingram, Lee, and Haganah be adjacent to each other. If at any time they find themselves adjacent, all good order infantry units involved must undergo a random selection to see which ones is or are broken. Repeat the process as necessary until the units no longer violate the above rule. The Ingrun carried out a terrorist campaign in the 1930s against British occupiers and Arab enemies, actions strongly opposed by the Haganah. The Stern Group, or in some quarters the Stern Gang, were a group of former Ingruns led by Abraham Stern. They resisted the Ingruns' policy of halting terrorist operations against the British during World War II. Rule 1.6, the Haganah Zal. The Haganah was the standard Israeli army organization in 1948. It operated primarily underground up until the British withdraw. The Haganah comprised of three sections, the Palmek, the Hish, and the Hin. Each is described in more detail below. After the first truce, these organizations, along with the Ingram and Lay units, were incorporated into the Zal, the predecessor of the Israeli Defense Force. Now, if you think about that, once again, the game has to kind of accurately depict a uh, approximate six month, you know, conflict or possibly going into years if you include the British fight in it of a rapidly developing army and rule 1.6 does that um, pretty well. 1.61, Hish Zal. The field force of the Haganah were known as the Hish. Hish squads, half squads are represented by the counters shown above. Also used to represent the Zal after June 11th, 1948. The first truce after July 18, 1948, the second truce, former Palmach troops are also represented by Zal Connors. The following abilities apply to them. Squad, half squad have their broken side morale increased by one. Elite and first line squads, half squads are not subject to cowering, so they're following kind of a British influence there. Elite squads, half squads gain one extra movement point and have the same freedom of movement capabilities as leaders. An MC may not grant it to other units in any night scenario. So now that we've take, taken a look at the Israeli forces and the advanced squad leader Genesis game, we need to take a look at their opposites being the Arab forces. And that brings in a new section to squad leader review called The Losers in History. So while doing research for this board game review, I was, had a lot of difficulty finding um, Arab primary and secondary sources for the Battle of Israel in 1948. Um, what I could find was generally written by Israelis, so there would be an inherent bias in it. Uh, why is there no documentation um, compared to so many other wars where there's so many memoirs and things like that? And then it occurred to me that generally within like the Western view of things and how we view history, um, the Arabs were seen as pretty non-resistive, not organized, lost the wars quickly, and that's it and we don't have any good counter arguments to it. And that goes into a larger problem that the layman historian is going to have with the losers. Now, I'm not talking about people like with their masters, their doctorates, but if you just have your basic uh, YouTube certified history, you're gonna find um, that you're missing a lot of critical information. Another good example of this is the best known book about the Battle of France and France losing is Alistair Horne's epic To Do a Battle. That book was written over 54 years ago. The newest book on uh, France losing World War II is um, by Philip Nord. It was published, I believe, in 2013. I think it's just called France 1940, but I'll put the full um, citation name in the book at the bottom of this here. That book does not provide any good military analysis of actually what happened, and it's more of a political argument that if all these other Western democratic nations lost to the Germans before France lost, of course they were going to lose. And what we're doing, you know, um, 
by not studying the losers more is we're giving our current military forces, you know, a great and our current history a great, great disservice because there are times that even the French army showed great tactical brilliance in 1940. And the Polish army when the Germans invaded at the start of World War II, but there just isn't a lot of documentation. I shouldn't have learned about the French resistance at Stone during World War II from Squad Leader. It should have been in that book by Alistair Horn, but it's not. But once again, it doesn't it doesn't fit the stereotype. What else are we missing, you know, when we don't take time to study the losers in conflict. Well, let's take a look at the Arvin. Now, recently, in the last 20 years, the Army of the Republic of South Vietnam has recently gotten a little more primary and secondary um, documentation. The Arvin veterans that live in the U.S. are a little more willing to talk openly to historians, and historians have done their um, due diligence covering the conflict. But the Arvin was plagued with a lot of logistical problems. They were pre plagued with a lot of uh, political problems, and all those things deserve to be studied in depth. Because if we don't look at the losers with, like, greater seriousness, and we just assume, oh, they sucked, they didn't want to fight, yada, 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 uh, the same problems that plagued the Arvin or the French Army of 1940 can end up plaguing the United States today or any other Western military, you know, as it engages in conflict. The world somehow. Here, where we look at the armies of the... So Bob O'Connor and the rules for Genesis 1948 grouped the following Arab countries together as far as rules and unit descriptions. The Syrians and Lebanese, the Iraqis, Egyptians, and the Transjordan Arab Legion, and the ALA, AAS, the Muslim Brotherhood, and Arab Irregulars. Now, these armies combined generally had a problem with the state of Israel existing. They generally uh, wanted to liberate um, what would be considered uh, Israeli-occupied Arab ter territories. But beyond that, there is no real established, agreed-upon war goal, and there's not even an agreement upon whether the state of Israel should exist or not. While some countries should feel that Israel should be wiped off the map in 1948, while the actual conflict is going on, Golda Meir is going to Jordan trying to work out a foreign, foreign policy deal that would allow both nations to coexist. What everybody wants, you know, out of what was or is Palestine is vastly different and vastly more complex. Some are, as I said, willing to live with an Israeli state. Some are not. Some want certain rules. Some want to expand their kingdoms. Some of these armies don't want kingdoms at all. They're not communicating with each other. There is no um, all Arab general staff. There is no um, general war planning with all of them. They are all simply kind of just advancing into Israel, hoping it'll all, it'll all work out. And naturally, it doesn't. So when we look at how Bob Connor designed these armies and grouped them together, let's take a look at what few secondary resources we have on the Arab armies of 1948 and how that kind of applies to the rules that he wrote. John Laffin in the Men at Arms Osprey Arab Armies of the Middle East Wars 1948 to 1973 says the following about the Arab countries that fought the Israelis in the 1948 war. Much foreign military influence as well as political interference is evident in the Middle East wars. For instance, the Egyptian army of 1948 was largely British equipped and fought by British methods. Many officers had served with the Egyptian units attached to the British army during the desert campaigns of 1940 to 1943. The Syrian and Lebanese forces were equipped in 1947 to 1948 with the weapons of their former colonial masters, the French, and they used French tactics. The teeth of the Jordanian army was the Arab Legion, British led, trained, and armed. Considering that their aim was always to have been to crush Israel, the Arabs have collectively suffered from a lack of unified command. Generally, they have not even cooperated with one another, but have simply fought separate wars at the same time. 
As national armies, the Arab forces have had other built-in handicaps. At root is the psychological Islamic belief of Bismillah, if Allah wills. This makes training and leadership practically irrelevant, and until the 1970s, it undermined planning. As late as the 1960s, some generals rejected serious planning as irreligious on the grounds that such activity questioned Allah's omnipotence. Commanders in the field either fabricate success or to justify failure exaggerate the size of enemy forces. Each day a war goes on, the worse the confusion becomes. Field commanders do not obey orders because they know they are filled and based on fanciful misinformation which they themselves originally sent in. As we've taken an in-depth review of the actual rules for the game, unlike Den Bien Phu for this squad leader review, I'm not going to take an in-depth look at the counters, if only because for them to be 100% historical accurate, everything would have to look British and it'd have to be British colored, uh, British counter design, and it would be very, very, very confusing. The game designer decided best to kind of make the Israelis look American and then use a combination of British and French and later Russian colors uh, for the Arab forces. But something that everyone would be interested in is the big thing behind me, which would be the map of Jerusalem in 1948. So let's take a few minutes here and take a look at this um, magnificent historical map. So we're just taking a look at the construction of the map here, and you'll notice this is a large hex map. It was actually quite difficult to get this to um, build correctly. Um, it could cause a lot of confusion pretty quickly just because there's so much of the city and there's so many spacings. If it so happens that you can get an older version of the map uh, from eBay or from the Critical Hit website, uh, please go ahead and do that. It'll just kind of save you a headache it's also fairly large, which means you're gonna need more space in your home to kind of hold it all and maintain it all. As you notice uh, in all my videos, I laminate everything. So there is gonna be kind of a glare um, with this review. So um, just bear with me through that. So this map is very much living history. It is almost like a sightseeing map of Jerusalem. Right here you have the Dome of the Rock, which is the Muslim holy site. This is where they believe uh, God made Adam, and it is considered holy and is actually, to my limited understanding, maintained by the government of Jordan. Depicted in the map here is the Christian Cemetery in Jerusalem. This is actually where none other than Oscar Schindler was buried after he died. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong. This is the Holy Church of the Septicular. It is ran by uh, the Catholics. This is actually where they believe Jesus was sacrificed and not too far from Calvary, where they believe he was buried and rose again. Although no longer as active in Jerusalem, you also have the Armenian Quarter. This is a place where Armenian monks established a small little fiefdom to themselves and during the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 they actually formed their own militias and fought against the IDF forces. So something you'll also notice in the map, and if I can zoom in on it correctly, is this huge wall going pretty much over most of Jerusalem. That is the Turkish wall made during the Ottoman Empire. For it in the game, I believe it is counts as a level two obstacle and it is a plus two or plus three TEM per die roll. Any scenario you play in this, pretty much usually the Israeli forces are trying to breach through the gate. Um, so that adds a whole new area of interest and a main area that you have to defend if you're the Arab players. In addition, I believe the scenario calls for you to defend the entire wall. I need to make a point of clarification here. So Genesis 3, uh, 1948, this gives you the rules and the counters and a bunch of the scenarios. Currently from Critical Hit, to actually obtain this map here, you're gonna get the add-on, with it, which is Jerusalem 48, that comes with the subsequent rules for the battles in the actual city, and it covers from 1948 to the Six-Day War. 
So in looking at all the overall rules for Genesis 48 and its Jerusalem add-on, a question of balance of Arab versus the Israeli forces definitely comes into play, considering the fact that uh, the Israelis have Japanese leaders, that they generally have super elite squads, and the Arabs don't even get the benefits of their former allied colonies, being the cowering capabilities and the black to hit for the French artillery, what can you do when you're actually playing the game to keep the playing field even and actually possibly win as the Arab forces? And with that in mind, we're going to look at some advanced squad leader strategy. All right, so once again, all my stuff is laminated, so I apologize uh, if you get any glare. This is kind of a dramatic reenactment of the gate crashing scenario that I actually played with a friend. And in this, the Israeli forces have already jumped the wall and broken through, and they've just got killer squads. So they've got a couple 748s, 648s, 92s. 447s, and their job basically is to destroy the Arab Irregulars while the Arabs are trying to move up out of Jerusalem heading in this direction. So you can tell there's an extreme balance issue here. You got 447 against 778s. You've got um, 247s against uh, 648s. Oh yeah, and did I mention you have a Israeli hero with a Molotov cocktail which would who would love nothing more than to set a building on fire and just burn it to the ground that you're in. So things are not looking good for you. So the key here is you can't do multi-group fire uh, given the units that you have, is you've really got to use advance to your key and you need to make it really hard for the Israeli forces to um, get massive amounts of kill. So you have to make them fight for every shot. So the key is during your advance phase to really basically build a wall, take as many low um, firepower shots as you can, um, hope that you can pin them, hope that you can cause a couple desperation morales and you can continue to just boogie on down and get out of the city. So after your advance phase, if you're the Arab Irregulars, basically everything should start looking like this. This is going to be far harder for target acquisition uh, for the Israeli forces. They're um, going to have to use each individual squad or a whole group uh, their whole group just to eliminate 1447. Let's even look at this here, um, and I'll try to do this while holding my hand. If these guys end up entering close combat now, they're only going to take out one unit, or if they split them, they're only going to take out two. So that still leaves an overwhelming majority for you to keep moving. So don't try um, to fight the Israeli forces. Just try to live to fight for another day. So the question I always ask and answer myself per squad leader reviews is do you does should one purchase this product or not? Owning this game, as you can tell, I learned a lot about the Israeli Arab conflict. It opens a world of historical research. Uh, the game itself actually covers from 1948 all the way till about the Six Day War, and possibly after that, I decided because each conflict is so complex and nuanced and the politics change so much that it would be better just to stick to what I saw um, in 1948. So if you want it for a learning opportunity, it would be really good to purchase. As I mentioned earlier, this is Critical Hit's highest selling game. Uh, when I last looked just a couple weeks ago, as a matter of fact, uh, Genesis was sold out. Uh, this was, of course, after um, the terrible events of October 7th and all the aftermath that happened. And we live in very contested and polarized times. And I can't help but wonder if one purchased this game at this point in history, for most people, would it just sit on the shelf or be actively played? Like I said, I don't know um, too many people talking online about this game. So I'd go ahead and say purchase it, but I wouldn't plan to be playing it with anybody um, for a few years.